A chill went down Jason's spine. You've decided to fight, he said, trying to fathom the words coming from his former teacher with the same veneration as if Frigere herself were speaking. Is that what you're telling me? That is not what I said. Seacoat turned on him and fixed him with a piercing stare. I said that I had a choice, and that I have tried both of the options already. I fought off the far outsiders. Then I fled the fire of the inner galaxy, seeking the outer darkness so that I might be alone, so that I might be safe. And for many years I was just that. Then you came to disturb my peace. The Yuzhan Vong came first, he reminded the living planet. You both invade my sanctuary, but with different intentions. The image of Verger's feathered eyebrows went up in surprise. You presume a lot, young Jedi, Seacoat said, without knowing what the far outsiders said to me, what they demanded of me, or what they tried to take from me. You seem confident to speak of their intentions. Jason bowed his head apologetically. You're right, of course. He raised his eyes to meet those of Verger. Nevertheless, you must have seen something different about us. You allowed us to land, after all. The Yuzhan Vong you simply destroyed. The Jedi have never openly meant me harm, and I have learned much from you in the past. There is much I have left to learn, and you can help with that under the right circumstances. Many people here remember your kind, and would have been keen to have you here but for your war. We're here in search of peace, not war, Jason said injecting every word with as much sincerity as he could muster. How can I give you peace? Jason shook his head. This was the question that had haunted him ever since his teacher's death. I don't know, he admitted. But there has to be something, otherwise Verger would never have sent us in the first place. I could give you weapons to help you fight your war, Seacoat said. The far outsiders are invisible to the life flows that the First Magister called the Potentium, and that you Jedi call the Force but that does not make them utter abominations. Ever since their first attack, I have been examining fragments of destroyed vessels, seeking to understand the principles by which they operate. Back engineering their technology, Danny said. Precisely. Much that I found was confusing and disturbing, but I took what I could and made it my own. My living ships and weapons bear similarities to those of the Far Outsiders, and few of their weaknesses. Jason felt his breath catch in his throat. Was this why Verger had sent them to Seacoat? Part of him was excited by the thought of beating the Yuzhan Vong at their own game, but it didn't ring true with what he remembered of his teacher. He doubted she had intended for them to find superweapons to help destroy the Yuzhan Vong. A deeper understanding of their enemy, yes, and perhaps a new weakness, but not another means of wreaking slaughter. What's wrong, Jason? Seacoat asked him. You don't look pleased. I guess I'm not, he said. I don't think that's why we're here. You're not here to get our help in the war? Jupiter asked. We are, yes, but not like that. Then how? What else do we have to offer you? I don't know. The image of his teacher crooked one eye higher than the other in a distinctly avian gesture. I am a force unlike anything you have come across before, Seacoat said. Are you trying to tell me that were I to offer myself as a weapon in your fight against the Far Outsiders... You would turn me down? Jason felt Saba and Danny staring at him, and for a moment two words warred with his thoughts. Yes, because he was tired of death and destruction, and the endless cycle of violence. A military victory for the Galactic Alliance would require the utter genocide of the Yuzhan Vong species. How could he possibly live with himself if he was in any way responsible for something like that? And no, because he could see no other way to defend those he loved. If there was no other option but military might, he couldn't stand by and watch his friends and family be slaughtered. His conscience would be clear to turn down the offer of such a weapon, he knew. But what was a moral victory, if in the end it meant the deaths of trillions? The weight of the future might rest heavily upon what he would say next, yet Jason felt incredibly small at that moment. With a word he could change the course of the war and therefore the destiny of his people. Well. Seacoat prompted. What is your answer? No. The word seemed to echo in Luke's mind as he imagined generations of children who might not live if the Galactic Alliance failed in the fight against the Yuzhan Vong. Children such as his own son, Ben. He saw every species of the galaxy enslaved to the biological slave machine of Supreme Overlord Shimra. Every cell screaming rebellion. 
but every limb yoked in an endless cycle of pain and despair. With such images in his mind, could he really afford to turn down the means to the galaxy's salvation that Seacoat might bring? You would accept such an offer? said the image of Anakin Skywalker, face tipped forward as though seeking reassurance that he'd heard correctly. Luke nodded slowly, deliberately. I would. But even as he spoke the words, he couldn't help but wonder if, in accepting the offer, he might be straying too close to the dark side or encouraging Seacoat to do so. Then consider the offer made, Seacoat said, smiling broadly. Behind Luke, the Pharaohans gasped as one. This they hadn't expected, and neither had Luke. What about all this talk about wanting peace and to be left alone? Mara asked. She made no attempt to hide her suspicions. I still desire those things, Seacoat said. I just know that I cannot have them here, or while the far outsiders trouble this galaxy. So my offer is for my benefit as much as it is your own. But, Seacoat, Roll spluttered, what of Sanctuary? Sanctuary has already been irreparably shattered, Seacoat answered. You see, the escape of the Coral Skipper from the Moon M3 was not entirely fiction. One vessel did manage to escape my net during the attack, and we must presume that that ship is returning to its masters to report on my whereabouts. The words provoked a look of both horror and surprise on the faces of Darek and Roll, horror for Seacud's decision to help the Jedi, and surprise perhaps because even their godlike planet had not been able to prevent one of the enemy's ships from escaping. Seacoat must have seen this in their expressions, too. I guess I am not as all-powerful as you think me, it said to the Pharaohans. Tomorrow and Luke, it added. Nor you. Is that a sobering thought? Yes. Stunned silence fell about the rain-soaked pit in the wake of Jason's answer to Seacoat. He could feel Saba and Danny looking at him, uncomprehending. How could he have said that? Their eyes asked. How could he have damned countless millions to unspeakable misery? He turned away from them both, not wanting their silent accusations. Deep in his heart he knew he'd made the right decision, and two voices in his mind reassured him of that. The first belonged to Winsafel, who had said to him on Scylla, The weapon at your side seems out of place on a man who professes to hate violence. The second voice belonged to his uncle. How do we fight a brutal, evil enemy without becoming brutal and evil ourselves? Somewhere between those two statements lurked the justification for his decision. It was the most difficult decision he'd ever had to make, and one he could not explain in a few words to either Danny or Saba. It pained him to think of what the ramifications of his decision might be for the rest of the galaxy, but he wasn't about to back down from the stand he was making. Saying yes to Zonama Seacoat had been a show of strength, not an act of weakness. After traveling as far as you have to beseech my help, Seacote said, you reject my offer. Are you sure? I stand by my decision, he answered soberly. Jason, Danny's objection petered out with a bewildered shake of her head. Military might is not what we need, he tried to explain. I cannot countenance destruction as a solution to the threat of destruction. In the long run, such a victory would only bring about our own downfall, he faced Seacote once again. I'm sorry, but I cannot accept your offer. The image of his former teacher smiled. Nevertheless, I have decided to join your cause. Jason frowned at Seacoat's unnaturally dry image. What are you saying? I'm saying that you have achieved what you set out to do, Seacoat said. I shall return with you to your war. Whether or not I can make a difference, of course, remains to be seen. Roger's image moved over to where Jason stood, his mind still numb with shock. To his surprise, the arm Verger's image placed around his waist exerted a faint pressure, like heavy fog. We are done with running, Seacoat told him softly, so only he could hear. We must find a way to end this war. Perhaps together we can work out which way we must go. Not just for ourselves, but for the sake of all life within the galaxy. Jason turned to stare into the eyes of his former teacher. In them he found great intellect and infinite compassion— as well as an ageless, unfathomable wisdom the likes of which he could never hope to achieve. But try as he might, he could find no reassurance in them, and that troubled him more than he was prepared to admit.